Hi, I am Dr. Sridhar Kalyanasandram. One of the topics which I have been requested to make a video on is about lab investigations in neonatology. I know this is a very vast topic and the first step in lab investigations is thinking about whether you really need to do that investigation. I have covered that in my lecture on minimizing interventions in neonatology and I will share the link to that here as well. We have a number of investigations we do and obviously this is not an exhaustive list. There will always be tests which are not covered in this. The rare air test, the TOR screen and the metabolic workup and so on. So the common ones are blood glucose, blood glass analysis, complete or full blood count, peripheral blood smear, blood culture, metabolic panel including the renal function and serum electrolytes, liver function test which itself is a panel and in the premature babies the bone profile which may include calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase, vitamin D levels and parathormone in some of them, the thyroid profile in certain indications, urine routine and culture and lumbar puncture. Of course the newborn screening is covered separately and I have two videos on newborn screening by itself and newborn screening in premature babies so I would refer you to watch those as well. Blood glucose is of course a crucial test in assessing any sick neonate. There is a separate playlist on hypoglycemia and blood glucose and I would refer you to that. Blood gas is a very vast topic as well and there is a separate playlist on blood gas analysis as well and please do refer them. I am not discussing those in this lecture. The blood count, complete or full blood count is typically included in all the admission workup and further requests for that depends on the clinical condition as well as what you find on your initial test results. So the main uh, parameters included in that are hemoglobin and hematocrit, platelet count, red blood cell count, uh, here a low count indicates a state of marrow erythropoiesis. Reticulocyte count is often used as an indication of whether your erythropoiesis has started in the marrow or not. So it's often raised in terms of hemolysis or blood loss and when a growing premature baby is reaching a stage where their erythropoiesis has started, this will help us decide on the need for transfusion at a certain cutoff. Suppose the hemoglobin is borderline and the reticulocyte count is coming up, you have a bigger support to wait and watch rather than to transfuse immediately. Mean corpuscular volume is the actual size of the red blood cell and as we know the fetal RBC is of a larger size and the MCV is higher. It's in the low hundreds in the newborn babies and a low mean corpuscular volume is seen in iron deficiency anemia. It's also seen in thalassemia and in newborn situation in immune hemolytic anemia like ABO setting. The mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration is a reflection of the actual amount of hemoglobin in a certain red cell. It tends to be low in iron deficiency and thalassemia and it tends to be high in situations where the red cell size itself is small like in osmotic fragile conditions, here it's spherocytosis and so on. The mean corpuscular hemoglobin itself is taking into account the actual uh, number of red blood cells in relation to the hemoglobin concentration. That tends to be low as well in uh, anemia due to thalassemia or iron deficiency. Of course, these parameters are not very commonly used in the newborn stages. The peripheral blood film is important to evaluate in any baby with unexplained anemia or a blood dyscrasia that you are concerned about. Even if there is persisting thrombocytopenia or you suspect a leukemoid reaction in trisomy 21 and other conditions, the blood film is very important. Most of the automated counters that uh, labs use might exaggerate the white cell counts because they count the nucleated red blood cells at the same time. So manual verification by the blood film is important to get an exact number. So you might have a high white cell count but when the corrected count comes it tends to drop as the nucleated red cells are eliminated in the count. One useful uh, tip not specifically in the newborn period but later on in infancy is to calculate the Menser index if you have a low MCV and you want to differentiate uh, iron deficiency from thalassemia. So uh, in thalassemia trait the Menser index goes below 13 that is mean corpuscular volume divided by the actual number of red blood cells and if the count is higher it usually indicates iron deficiency. So uh, in thalassemia as you know the marrow production is not uh, proceeding prog properly and so the RBC count tends to be low as well. Uh, RBC count tends to be high because of ineffective erythropoiesis and this drops your uh, Menser index. 
Uh, I'm not discussing this in detail, but just a quick uh, guide. When we see the hemoglobin, you'd be deciding on the need for transfusion. So most of us go conservative with the transfusion cutoff and it would depend on whether the baby is ventilated, whether there is oxygen requirement, the age of the baby. And as the baby gets older beyond one month, you start looking at the reticulocyte count as well. This, this is a reasonably conservative approach by the NNF and uh, most of us would follow something in this range. But a caution that you shouldn't allow it to drop too much because the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis post transfusion could be related to the level to which the hemoglobin is low. So don't allow it to drop too low and that could have an impact on the developing brain as well. So it's important to have a conservative approach in terms of reducing sampling losses. Uh, delayed cot clamping should be practiced as well to reduce the number of transfusions and you should avoid unnecessary transfusions without allowing it to drop to too low levels. Another parameter that is looked at on the blood count is the platelet count. The sampling technique is very important for the platelet count as if the sample is squeezed, you might lead to clumping and loss of platelets with erroneously low counts. So it's always good to advise your team to collect the full blood count sample when it is free flowing and to mix it with the reagent carefully as we collect so you don't need to keep repeating it. This is one of the tests that the lab often reports as hemolyzed and you keep pricking the baby to get the report. Again, think carefully whether you really need to repeat or you can do it at the next uh, time you're sampling the baby. The platelet count ranges from 150 to 450,000 uh, and you have uh, situations where you may need platelet transfusions. So where the baby is very sick with major bleeding or requiring major surgery, this is very rare that you transfuse when it drops below 100,000. And if in units with bleeding, coagulopathy before surgery or with allomune thrombocytopenia, you may transfuse at less than 50,000. Suppose you have transfused once or twice and the count keeps dropping, you can revise your threshold even in such cases. If the baby has no bleeding, uh, and the relatively stable premature babies, you may consider less than 25,000 as a cutoff. So this is again from the NNF uh, guidelines and it's fairly reasonable to follow these guidelines. The white cell count is quite variable and it is a not very specific test. The range is from 5,000 to 30,000. The normal labor process itself may cause the cell count to go up. And I mentioned the impact of the nucleated RBCs in your count as well. So always wait for the manual count to confirm. In a premature baby, the count is slightly on the lower side compared to the term babies where it can go up to 26 to 30,000. It has a limited value in diagnosing infection because of the non-specific nature as any stress can cause the white cell response. A very low white cell count may be more concerning than the high white cell count. The differential count where you look at neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes, basophils and eosinophils may give us some clue to certain conditions. The neutrophils are the most important component when it comes to uh, your immunity and uh, fighting infections. So the absolute neutrophil count is a very important parameter and uh, you have to look at the segmented neutrophils as well. A neutrophil count of less than 1500 is low and less than 500 is very low and both may be suggestive of the risk of sepsis. So you may have a lower threshold to treat if less than 500. And if the count is less than 200 and the baby is symptomatic, you might consider uh, neoposin or similar uh, agents. Many growing premature babies may have relatively low absolute neutrophil count around the time of discharge. So it's often seen when you do the final blood count that the neutrophil count is on the lower side, say 200, 300 and babies relatively well. So you need to advise the parents to monitor for risks of infection and uh, keep a low threshold to admit them if there is a concern and continue to repeat it weekly till it starts increasing. Most of the time, it tends to resolve on its own. Uh, the immature neutrophils have a C-shaped nucleus which is not segmented and these are called the band cells. And when the baby has an acute uh, exposure to infection, the band cells are released from the bone marrow. Uh, this is called a left shift and the ratio of immature to total neutrophils can guide the risk of infection. So 0 to 0 0.2 is normal, 0 to uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.25 is suggestive of infection. The higher the immature cell count goes, the higher the risk of infection and possibly poorer the prognosis. We have Munro's chart and Mazinho's chart for the very low birth weight babies for looking at the absolute neutrophil count uh, in 
babies in the immediate postnatal period. So you can see that there's a surge in the neutrophil count, which then drops and settles down by day two to three. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we cannot rely too much on these counts and you need to correct for the age of the baby when you're looking at the actual counts. We have a group of tests called inflammatory markers and C-reactive protein is the most common inflammatory marker that is tested. It's an acute phase reactant protein which is produced in the liver, usually in response to any form of inflammation. So the source of the inflammation can be infection, it can be vaccination, or it may be related to inflammation in the lungs related to an aspiration pneumonia, for example, with meconium or milk aspiration. Any procedure on the baby, like a surgical procedure, can cause a rise in CRP. And if the baby had an extra visitation injury as well, this could cause a rise in CRP. So it's very important to realize that it's an acute phase reactant inflammation and it's not fully specific to infection. The normal is less than 6 to 10 milligrams per cent and a higher, more sustained rise is seen in bacterial sepsis usually we see numbers more than 40 and a lag period of 12 to 24 hours before it rises is seen so you cannot rule out infection just because the CRP is normal and this is one scenario where we might be finding procalcitonin to be useful we have some extreme premature babies who don't mount a significant CRP response despite confirmed sepsis your CRP count may not be high in these babies so you have to be cautious before you decide to treat based on a CRP response or uh, not to treat based on a normal CRP. Also the trend can guide the duration of treatment. The peak value of the CRP doesn't necessarily indicate the severity as a quick response may be seen in aspiration pneumonia It can reach 70, 80 and come down to 40s by the very next day. In a gram negative sepsis it often goes to 200s and the same with fungal sepsis and it takes a few days to start responding. So and failure to drop in the CRP or a CRP continuing to rise for the 24 to 48 hours after you start the antibiotic doesn't mean it's an indication to change antibiotics or to intervene. You just monitor the culture report, you monitor the baby clinically and the clinical uh, uh, response of the baby is more important than the inflammatory marker. Of course, if it doesn't reduce by three to four days, we start thinking more in terms of what we should be doing again. Serum procalcitonin is a relatively more expensive test. It's another marker of inflammatory response. There is a quicker rise, there is a higher peak and also a quicker fall. So in the first one to three days of life, uh, the labor process has an impact on the C procalcitonin and because it's very sensitive, the range is wide. It often goes to 10 to 20s range in the normal newborns in the first one to three days. So you cannot rely on it to decide on treatment. So we don't often do that in the first three days. Uh, later on, it can be used uh, in cases where the clinical features correlate with sepsis, but the CRP is normal. And because the same sample can be used as a CRP, you can always request the lab to add it on. If the CRP comes back uh, in a normal range and you want to rule out infection, you can add. So that's a more cost-effective way to arrange for the procalcitonin. Again, the trend can be used, but if the CRP has risen as well, it's cheaper to repeat the CRP and monitor. A blood culture is very important as a confirmatory test for uh, sepsis and uh, we need a good sample of 0.5 to 1 ml. Take with the full aseptic precautions. Um, the blood bank or the microbiology lab should make sure that the, uh, the agent they use is appropriate for the newborns with this lower sample volume. Sterile gloves should be used and uh, skin cleaning with chlorhexidin of suitable strength to the gestation of the baby should be used to avoid contamination because the contamination a growth of a bug which is not really the cause of infection can confound your treatment plans. Most labs report a positive culture by 36 hours and if the baby is clinically stable with the normal inflammatory markers and the culture is negative, we could stop antibiotics by this stage. A positive culture would determine the duration of treatment and it would depend on the nature of the organisms and the lumbar puncture findings as well. Once we get the sensitivity report, you need to rationalize your antibiotic treatment. It is not always necessary to repeat a blood culture once you have a positive growth if the inflammatory markers are reducing well. But if the inflammatory markers are not reducing or if the baby is not clinically responding well, it's a good idea to repeat a blood culture after a few days, especially in gram-negative sepsis, so that you know for sure that your antibiotics are eliminating the bug and then you can plan to stop the antibiotics a certain period after you have a negative culture. So if you plan a 14-day treatment for a gram-negative sepsis, you can say at least one week after the negative culture. 
Now, lumbar puncture is a very controversial topic and you can refer my earlier videos on when we should do lumbar puncture in suspected cases. In early onset sepsis, uh, all the babies who have a high inflammatory marker which is not explained by other factors like aspiration pneumonia and babies with positive blood culture uh, or any baby with a neurologic symptom with suspected infection should get a lumbar puncture. In late onset sepsis, the likelihood of meningitis is more and so we should have a lower threshold. We should consider LP as part of the sepsis screen and if it is not done at that stage for any reason, you can follow a similar approach uh, if you have a high inflammatory marker or a positive blood culture or if the baby has neurologic symptoms, you should do. It's very important to document your plan for the lumbar puncture in the notes and if the parents disagree for any reason, that should be clearly documented as well. The only exception where a baby with a positive blood culture doesn't get the lumbar puncture is where we have a coagulase negative staphylococcus sepsis. Most of the time this infection is not known to cause meningitis and so we don't uh, necessarily do a lumbar puncture in these cases. We consider herpes PCR in any newborn with rash and features of sepsis or high fever in a baby with encephalopathic features. So we should treat the baby with acyclovir while waiting for results and this often proves to be a problem because the results may take one week or so and the baby needs to be exposed to this IV uh, medication for that period of time. This is just to give a uh, summary of what we are looking at in the CSF in babies uh, without uh, meningitis so outside this range would mean you consider meningitis. So the age is a parameter you have the white cell count, we have the protein and the glucose. We also send the gram stain and the culture. It's very important that the CSF sample is analyzed quickly so that a delay in analysis may affect your glucose levels. It can affect your cell counts as well. A traumatic lumbar puncture is very difficult to interpret because the red blood cells would be high and the white cells which are high in the blood may uh, represent or reflect in the CSF as well. The correction factors are not always accurate. so. Even though if it is just a few, uh, I mean, slight smearing of uh, blood in the CSF, you can do some correction. If it's frankly blood stained, you just send it for culture and you have to ignore the rest of the parameters. So you can see that the cell count is uh, going up to 0 to 30 in term babies and the protein count is slightly higher compared to uh, normal babies. The preterm babies have a slightly higher uh, protein content as well. The glucose roughly... Uh, you compare the glucose to the blood glucose range and uh, obviously you need to do the sugar before the lumbar puncture so the stress does not uh, cause the rise in the blood glucose level. Coming on to the serum electrolytes, so we have serum sodium with the normal range of 135 to 145 millivolent per liter. Hyponatremia is more significant if it's less than 130 and if it is less than 125 you need urgent correction as it can be dangerous if it drops below 120 with neurological manifestations. Uh, I have uh, detailed a uh, couple of videos on sodium balance and SADH as well as correction of hypernatremia. I would refer you to them as well. Syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion is a very common cause of uh, low sodium and fluid restriction is a mainstay of treatment. A low intake and excess loss are additional factors, uh, though not common. The bicarbonate loss that happens in the urine in the extreme preterm babies can lead to hyponatremia over time and poor weight gain can be a characteristic in these babies as well. Hypernatremia is more related to the free water loss, insensible water loss in the extreme premature babies and the dehydration due to inadequate feeding in term babies when they present to your OPD. A very careful correction of the free water deficit very slowly so the sodium doesn't drop more than 0.5 milliequivalent per hour. It's important to avoid the brain injury. Serum potassium, the normal range is 3.5 to 5.5 milliequivalent per liter and it tends to be on the higher side in the extreme premature babies where there is tissue breakdown as well. As it's sensitive to squeezing, proper sampling technique is important and it's often good to have a blood gas potassium at the same time as you send a lab potassium. So if it comes hemolyzed in the lab and they don't report the potassium, you have the uh, potassium from the gas. So you don't need to repeat the sample. The potassium has important role in cardiac and skeletal muscle contraction and in maintaining acid base balance. And if it is abnormal, it can cause weakness, arrhythmia risk comes up and ECG changes and in severe cases, it can be fatal as well. 
Hypokalemia can be due to too little intake and most common reason is due to diuretic related losses from the renal immaturity. GI losses if they are not replaced can lead to hypokalemia as well and high potassium can be due to excessive intake and blood cell hemolysis, excessive bruising in the extreme premature babies, acidosis uh, due to the way the hydrogen ion exchanges in the secretory system and multiple blood transfusions. Uh, as I said in a premature baby a potassium of 6, 6.5 is fairly common and if it stays in the same range without worsening you can just monitor them. However, if it is worsening, especially in the setting of renal injury or reduced renal output, you should be cautious. So consider correcting the hypokalemia by the oral or IV route if it is dropping below 3 millivolen per liter. And in hyperkalemia, if it's more than 6.5, stop all the extra sources of potassium first, monitor the ECG and be prepared to treat if it continues to rise. So you have salbutamol injections or nebulization, uh, calcium to revert the immediate effect or insulin dextrose infusion and potassium absorbing resins uh, that are used with caution in the premature babies. Calcium is the most abundant mineral in the body and it's needed for bone mineralization. Majority of the total calcium is contained in bone and this is true even for the premature babies. In the term babies, ionized calcium reaches an adder of 1.1 to 1.36 millimoles per liter by 24 hours and nearly 30% will develop early hypocalcemia within the first two days. Most of them are asymptomatic and so doesn't need treatment. So the calcium, the hypocalcemia is defined as an ionized calcium less than 1.1 or a total serum calcium less than 8. In a premature baby, because the drop is higher, we accept uh, ionized calcium less than 1 or total calcium less than 7. However, you tend to correct it more aggressively in the premature babies who are symptomatic because calcium has a very important role in your hemodynamic stability. So we can, the calcium will improve on its own with the increased calcium intake in the feeding, increased renal phosphorus excretion and improved parathormone function. We have to correct the calcium levels in babies with hemodynamic compromise as I mentioned. And a very high calcium more than 10.8 is less common, but if you notice it, it needs to be monitored and corrected as uh, appropriate treatment will reduce metastatic calcifications in the kidney and other organs. Phosphorus is another metabolism, uh, I mean another uh, electrolyte which is related to the bone metabolism. The normal range is 5 to 7.8 milligrams and it tends to be on the higher side in newborns as a whole. Uh, it's needed for bone mineralization, erythrocyte function, cell metabolism and the generation and storage of energy. Most of the phosphorus is in the skeleton and the remaining is found in soft tissues and extracellular fluid. Most of the body phosphorus is organic in the form of phospholipids and the remaining is inorganic and what we measure is actually the inorganic phosphorus. The serum concentration varies widely and is dependent on the intake and renal excretion. Levels are low at birth but they rise rapidly after birth. Higher levels are seen in formula fed babies than in breastfed babies. You often find an inverse relationship between the serum ionized calcium and the serum phosphorus and this is mainly related to the parathormone balance. If the calcium tends to be low, parathormone tends to rise and the renal excretion of phosphate will increase. So you have phosphate wasting as well. Bone profile is usually done in the extreme premature babies and it's very important to maintain an adequate level of vitamin D, calcium and phosphorus uh, to prevent osteopenia and appropriate calcium to phosphorus ratio in the TPN should be maintained. As I've discussed in the video on TPN, when the amino acid content increases, your pH changes and you're able to add more calcium and phosphorus in a stable form. Uh, many of us start using the organic form of phosphate, the glycerophosphate in the TPN, which gives more stability and less chance of precipitation. Vitamin D supplement should be started in the early stages as well. And it's important to measure the level and increase supplement if needed. And many premature babies uh, need to 2000 units or so even they are extreme low birth weight babies. Avoid the use of diuretics in such babies and remember caffeine and steroids may affect bone health as well. If the phosphorus levels are low, supplement both calcium and phosphorus so that the parathormone axis doesn't get upset. A relative deficiency of calcium and phosphorus is supplemented can cause parathormone to rise and this can lead to further problems with secondary hyperparathyroidism. So the balance is important if you're supplementing one, tend to supplement both together. 
Monitor the serum calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase and vitamin D in all extreme low birth weight babies by 4 to 6 weeks of age. There is not much point doing it before that. A delayed progression of feeds is a risk and delayed fortification of feeds is a risk as well. So these are high risk babies where you would target. Once you start monitoring it, you can monitor it two weekly to see the response to the correction measures you are taking. Where the serum alkaline phosphatase is more than 900 units, add urine calcium and phosphorus measurements so you can be guiding the supplement without the risk of inducing secondary hyperparathyroidism. And if the case is refractory, consider measuring the parathormone level. Remember that it's an expensive test as well and you keep it as one of the later steps in investigation. The normal serum magnesium is 1.6 to 2.8 milligrams per deciliter. It's distributed primarily in the bone and muscle. It's needed for energy production, cell membrane function and protein synthesis. A low magnesium level of less than 1.6 milligrams per deciliter is usually asymptomatic unless it goes below 1.2 when you may have irritability, tremors and seizures. Hypomagnesemia is frequently seen along with hypocalcemia and you need to correct the hypomagnesemia before the response to the calcium correction is seen. So that's important to see in a case where you have refractory hypocalcemia, you measure the magnesium and correct it as well. And usually it's given as an intramuscular injection of the 50% magnesium sulfate. And uh, hypermagnesemia is more often related to maternal exposure to magnesium and the baby may tend to be floppy. It generally returns to normal after a few days and the treatment is with appropriate hydration and if it's really high, you may consider diuretics to correct it. The thyroid uh, profile is done in certain cases as the TSH is part of the newborn screen and be aware of the policy to repeat the newborn screen in the premature baby so you may have to individualize your department guidelines. Maternal hypothyroidism by itself is not an indication to do a full thyroid profile in the baby but if there was a past history of hyperthyroidism, you can add free T4 and TSH. The thyroid profile is part of prolonged jaundice workup as well. And in babies who are failing to thrive, you consider doing the thyroid profile as well. And uh, remember that the lab ranges are different in each lab. And when you get the results, refer to your ranges as the values may differ. Coming to the last part, which is serum bilirubin and liver function tests. Bilirubin measurement and monitoring, of course, is discussed as part of the jaundice management. There is a playlist on jaundice management I would refer you to. Liver function testing is indicated in all sick babies. Many times it's often increased in viral infections as well. So if you're not clear about the cause of the sepsis and it may be the first presentation of CMV, for example, and uh, <coughs> evaluation with LFT is important in such babies. It's also important as part of the prolonged jaundice screen, a jaundice which persists beyond two weeks in term babies and three weeks in premature babies. If the direct bilirubin is raised in these babies, we should consider further workup. And it's also included in the investigation for urinary tract infections. It's monitored in premature babies on TPN and TPN induced liver injury is one of the commonest reasons for an abnormal liver function test in the NICU. So the liver function has multiple components, those related to the synthetic function of the liver, mainly serum albumin and the coagulation profile. The serum albumin is often low in the premature babies and unless it goes below a level of two, for example, or if the baby is having third spacing with reduced urine output, we don't correct the albumin, we improve the nutrition and hope for the albumin to improve with time. The coagulation profile is related to the active production of coagulation factors in the liver and uh, we need time for it to manifest. So if there is abnormal uh, coagulation profile already, then the liver dysfunction is well established. The liver cell related uh, components like the AST and ALT, which is amino transferase enzyme. So when the injury to the hepatocytes happens, these enzymes will go up. Of course, you have non-specific reasons, non-hepatic reasons for the AST to rise like the birth trauma, it can be from the muscle, it can be from the skin and other organs as well. Lactate dehydrogenase is non-specific as well. Uh, there may be components related to cholestasis, which mainly involve the gamma glutamyl transferase, alkaline phosphatase and also the direct bilirubin levels. Where we have concerns of liver injury or liver disease, we, when we have a direct uh, bilirubin fraction increased, it's important to evaluate following a systematic approach involve the gastroenterologist were needed and we should not miss out on important underlying conditions. It's very important to have a timely diagnosis of such conditions and we shouldn't delay workup in such cases. 
So uh, I hope uh, this uh, talk is useful. Please do share. Thank you.